Now there were, we can hand them out, but there's some handouts. If you, if you guys, and I just thought you might find them interesting. One, um, this one with the two columns, it's kind of an A-B comparison thing. The verses underneath, that way you actually have to crack the verses open in your Bible and look at them to figure out what lines they go with for the most part. But um, as we get into to studying about the rapture, we know that um, some people contest the rapture that it even exists at all, let alone the timing of it. But folks will readily accept the second coming of Christ. That one's really hard. To, but some people will mush them all together or moosh them, depending on where you're from in the country. Uh, so the rapture on one side and the second coming on the other side, a lot of times people will... Um, mash things together or mush them together. And uh, that's their way of kind of saying that it's the same event. And you can always find, you can always find similarities and say, therefore, they're the same. But that's like saying, me and Larry are the same person. We're both men. We're bipedal. We're both from Southern California. You can find all these comparisons. We both wear glasses. You know, you can go over and over. <laughs> Bad puns, um, and but it's the differences, those the distinctions that you need to draw so that you see the difference. And uh, speaking of differences, the second sheet comparison between Israel and the church um, is another one of those types of comparisons because some groups will try to say. The church is Israel. The church is spiritual Israel, that kind of stuff, which is spiritual Israel, that phrase is not even in the Bible. Um, but that's, we, we can get into that sometime, and we probably will. There'll be some overlap for that. But Galatians is a good book that will inform those distinctions as well. So speaking of which, before we go, we will open in prayer. But I do have this, this very first thing here about uh, a word and context that's going to illustrate this point because as we move forward now I'm going to start doing some handouts like these and we're going to start examining some of these differences and similarities so that we can we need to affirm what we say we don't we're going to, going to get into some of these end time scenarios that there are some of these various end time scenarios we're not going to camp out and spend a lot of time in all of them you know equal time or whatever we're not going to do that the FCC does not rule here, and so we are, we're not going to spend equal time on all of them. But um, just to illustrate um, some of the incorrect thinking on, on um, some of those modes of thought, uh, particularly post-tribulationalism, um, but also some amillennial um, misapplication of words and, and things like that we, need, we should look at. So... Well, let's open up with a quick word of prayer, and we'll dive right in, okay? Lord, thank you so much for uh, this fellowship, and uh, thank you for the contribution we've had from, from folks sharing uh, over these past weeks and, and engagement questions. And it's great to, uh, to see and, and sometimes hear the gears working. Lord, we just want to honor you. We want to praise you. We want to lift you up. In everything that we do, we, we, can't, we can't learn enough. And we want to pursue Christ. We want to see what you have in store for us in the future. As awesome as your creation is here, Lord, we know it's cursed. And uh, Lord, we know that we're sinners. And, and uh, I think most of us here are done with this place. Um, and we're, we get excited about looking forward to the future and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what we have our eyes and our hearts set on, is when we will be perfected and sin, sinless and no longer um, dishonor you, no longer profane you, but instead, Lord, um, every minute, every second of our day will be glorifying you in the way that you deserve. So, Lord, we pray that you bless this study and that you would grant us wisdom and understanding as we move forward. It's in Christ's name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. Um, again, about words in context, as we said, uh, I mentioned uh, a week or so ago, too, that what will happen sometimes with, with uh, 
amillennialism is, and I just mentioned a second ago, is church and Israel being mixed together. And what a lot of people will do is they'll say, church, ecclesia, that's assembly. Therefore, since it's an assembly, hey, look, the word assembly is used in the Old Testament. Therefore, it's church. So I did this. It's kind of an absurd way to illustrate. And it kind of one of those things laying in bed trying to sleep at night I thought of. And it was just a simple, absurd way to illustrate that the same word is in all things at all times, okay? And you all should know that. But you get in these arguments with people sometimes and they insist. So the word book. You know, what's a book? Jump right in. Book. Yeah, codex. Uh, opens pages. That's a book. And then we have bookum. Well, does book there mean the same thing or when you're saying book them? Book them? Book them? Look at it because their it expression is to throw the book at them. And it so can be. It is intending to have the book thrust upon their face. So that <laughs> it can be. <laughs> And it used to be, back in the old days before computers, that when they booked people, they did actually physically write all these notations down in a book. Okay, one more example where it varies a little bit. Book it. So there's slang. Oh, right. no, Idiom. Amazing. And that's, you know, you see the cops coming down the road, and it's like, book it. Yeah. And you hit the road and you run. Cheese it, man, it's the fuzz. Cheese it, book it, <laughs> same thing. Like book them down. <laughs> What's that? That's right. You can book it. You can. So same thing with assembly. So um, I, I want to caution as well, because what a lot of armchair theologians will do, and it's not wrong, it's just we need to keep going and not stop there, is that you look at a concordance, you look up the word book, and you, it describes book. Okay? But context, and this is why uh, people who want to dig in and study even scholars will will run to a lexicon and you need to look at the full body of what's being said in the text in the words surrounding you're looking in the verses before and the next verses so you're looking at overall context and and a lot of times it's instructive to look at things like well who is the whole if it's an epistle who's the whole letter written to people I, you know it amazes me it shouldn't, but to this day, it amazes me how many people like to use 1 Corinthians as like an instruction manual on how to live life and how to operate in the body of Christ and how to use the spiritual gifts. No, it's not an instruction manual. Paul is castigating those people there at that church and saying, this is what you do, not this is what you do. He's saying, no, this is what you do, and you've got it wrong, and he's trying to set them straight. So... So there's that. So context means a lot. So um, in your studies, I'm just saying, don't you, it's, it's not just enough to crack a strong, exhaustive concordance open and look at the definition of a word and think that that encompasses and that's going to define the proper use of that word all the time, everywhere. Yep, it worked. Yay. Now, we're getting into four views of the end times because in the book of Revelation <clears throat> there's a lot of confusion. Um, it is the least trod on book by pastors and college professors, seminary professors. It's intimidating for a lot of folks. So we get a lot of different ideas that come out of this, and people get people get heated over it. Um, some people insist that the tribulation has happened in the past. We talked about this last week, that it happened back in 70 A.D., so it's over now. But if we look at Revelation chapter 4, Verse 1, we look at how we enter into this whole period here because I, I, I hate to run over what we've already talked about before, but just by review, last week we established that the book was written closer to about 96 A.D. Remember one of the churches that we, we read about 
it mentions a martyr, and there was a, a martyr in there who died well after 70 A.D. So we can date the book after that. Um, people will still argue, and they'll they'll still fight over it. Let's look at the just the first verse, and I'll show you where we're going with this. This is different than what we normally do when we're studying the book of Revelation. This is something I've wanted to do for a while, though, because all the questions that come up, and I don't know about you, but I see a lot of heated arguments, and I, I get some pushback sometimes about about the rapture and what's that about. So I thought, well, let's divert from there, there because we can't really move forward until we've solved that issue, that, until we've kind of settled that argument. So Revelation 4.1, After these things I looked. Okay, let's pause there a second. You remember when we were in chapter 1, verse 19? Remember we mentioned that weird phrase from the Greek, meta tauta? Um, Jesus told, told John in chapter 1, verse 19, write the things which you have seen, and he records them in chapter 1, and the things which are, and what are, the things that are is kind of defined by the word meditata after this. The things that are are the church age in chapters 2 and 3. We kind of covered that. And the things which will take place after this, meditata. So we define where the things that are end and the things that are just defined as after this by that phrase. It's a very specific phrase. And here it is in chapter 4, verse 1. Meta tauta, after these things or after this, I looked. And behold, what happened? A door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, Come up here and I will show you these things which must take place after this, meta tauta, again. So this looks and sounds an awful lot like some other verses that, that we've read that describe um, what it's like to be raptured. Lord calls us up or takes us up into heaven. So now begins the controversy, right? Um, all this back and forth and discussion about whether or not these things really happened. What we're going to do next week is we're going to um, take a look at other raptures in the Bible. Did you know that some raptures have already happened where people were taken? I know some of you all can probably think of one or two right now. What's, what are sometimes in the, in the Bible, even going back to the Old Testament, you can go back to Genesis and you can think of people who were taken up. Elijah and Enoch, yep. Philip was in the New Testament, and Acts, he was taken up. And the word taken is the same thing, it was, they were taken. Um, we don't know exactly what the rapture is going to look like. Um, we know in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, we'll be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And at the last trump, we go meet the Lord in the air. Well, and I kind of played with this in, in this book I just wrote. When you're changed in a moment, does that mean that you go up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye? It says you're changed in a moment. What if you ascend closer to the way Jesus ascended when he told his disciples or when he was there with his disciples and the angel said to him, the same way he left, he's coming back. Well, are we going to leave in the same way where they could just kind of watch him go up and would people see us that way? We just don't know. How about Elijah? The story of Elijah in 1 Kings, right? In 1 Kings, I was trying to think, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. No, 2 Kings, mostly Elisha. Uh, uh, Elisha's, everybody knows Elijah's getting ready to go up. And we can review this and we will. So all the prophets knew, everybody knew. Everybody's there, they're lined up at the river. Hey, today's the day that Elijah's supposed to go up. So it's not like it was a, a secret. He's supposed to go up. Today's the day. It's kind of like rapture day. So Elijah takes off his mantle, strikes the river, it parts, they cross. Elisha goes over with him. He's there waiting. And, uh, you know, Elijah's kind of going, well, if there's anything else you need before I go, now's the time to ask, you know. So Elisha says, I'd like a double portion of the spirit that you've had. 
And he says, man, you're asking a tough thing, but I tell you what, if you're supposed to have it, the Lord will show you my departure. So what Elisha saw was a chariot of fire came down, right? When they're talking, they're visiting, and this chariot of fire comes up between them, like the limos here, <laughs> okay? And Elijah gets on, and he takes off. So Elisha saw it, and to demonstrate that Elisha actually got this extra measure of the spirit, the same spirit that um, Elijah had, you know, he struck the mantle down because what happened when Elijah went up? I guess he didn't need his coat, anymore, his overcoat anymore. It came off his mantle, and Elisha took it. So he stroked, struck the river, and he, he crossed back over. But now, here's the question. What did the other people see? Did they see the chariot of fire too, or did they just see when the angel went like this and grabbed them to pull him out of the chariot, he just disappeared? Or did when Elijah set his foot on the deck of the chariot, did he disappear? Well, it, scripture gets silent in places that I really want to know, so it's kind of irritating to me sometimes. So, so here's the question, is that what if our rapture is that way? What if we think we're going to go drifting up in the sky because that's the way we tend to think of it, but what if, what if a bunch of fiery chariots, chariots come by to pick us up? I think that would be kind of awesome. I would like that. So movies and books and things kind of in, in stories and Hal Lindsey's books and things, everything kind of describe what the rapture is supposed to be like. You know, all our clothes and false teeth, everything's supposed to fall off and we're going to go up into heaven buck naked. I don't know. That would be awkward. <laughs> it's like, I, I need the robe first, Lord, and I'll drop things off and, you know, whatever. So we don't know. We just don't know. So we get to Revelation 4 here now. And we're, so we're at this crossroads where the heated arguments begin. You know, and and um, now for those that are that missed tonight that want it, I, I post this video on on YouTube, and I'm going to get some nasty comments and people from people, um, post millennial people maybe, but all millennial people who say there isn't a rapture, and uh, we just got through talking about Enoch, and Enoch is also described in uh, wasn't it Hebrews 11, right? Hebrews 11 talks about Enoch. He was, and then. He, and then he was not he, because the Lord took him. And that's a phrase that is very common with rapture events is the Lord takes him. Um, in the coming weeks, we'll be looking at things that, that uh, inform rapture and end times, the tribulation, and going into the millennium. Um, and that is the ancient Hebrew wedding traditions. And there is a part of the wedding tradition that's called the taking. And it's when the bridegroom comes to take his bride. And he doesn't come all the way to her house and knock on the door. And he doesn't send the limo. He comes himself, but he meets part way, maybe at her gate. It's kind of like meeting down at the end of the driveway here. He doesn't come all the way. So they meet part way, and her party comes and joins him where he's at at the end of the drive, at the, at the gate. They're making a big noise, there's a shout, there's trumpets, there's banging on things. It's, it's a big party atmosphere. The two parties merge, and they go off to the Father's house, and they have their celebration that is one week long, seven days. It's like tribulation week, seven years. So a lot of things that inform this period that we just can't ignore, even regardless of where our, what our theology is, we've got to look at these things that if you have an opposing view, um, you don't just discount it and say, there's no rapture, period, and just drop it at that. Well, you've got to explain some things. It's not like it's brand new. It's not like rapture's never happened before. So we'll, we'll get into some of those. Philip was taken up. Paul describes you know, a similar type of an event. So we'll get there eventually. But, but So let's just delve in. And any questions so far on that? And at this point, there's all kinds of questions and things. Do you, does anybody have a favorite rapture verse or or particular passage or something that you really... First Thessalonians 4. First Thessalonians 4, which says what? Go ahead. <clears throat> well, let's see. Go back to that. Get it in context. Yeah. What, verse 18 or somewhere on there? Or? Yeah, verse 17. We'll 17? Go, go back to verse 14. Okay. Verse 13, where uh, Paul writes to Thessalonians, says, But I did not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, 
lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Dead in Christ shall rise first. And this is the key one. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And the phrase caught up. Yeah, so, in, you know, the, uh, the interesting factoid when people tell you, though, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Yes, it is, just not in the English Bible. <laughs> right. So it's caught up here in, in English, harpazo in Greek, but in the Latin Vulgate, the word is... Rapturo? Rep, rep, rep something, rep something. Yeah, <laughs> rap star, rap, 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 rap artist. Or, yeah. yeah. I don't have my Latin Bible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it is there, it's just been transliterated, and so it, in English, it's, it's, it's like saying that your pharmaceutical medications don't exist because it's in Latin. You know, so because these medical doctors learn so many things and, and things are in scientific terminology are, are named in Latin doesn't mean they don't exist. So and then last week, let's not forget, we spent some time going into uh, um, I, li I, I still really like Revelation 310. We spent a little time in that. We might revisit that again. But I like Revelation 310 because it describes an event that happens upon the whole world and those on, on the whole earth and those who are on the earth. Yeah, you guys don't have to worry about it because, well, how does that happen? You know, if we're, we're here or we're not. You know, we're on the earth or we're not. So, so I, like that, I like that too. Let's take a look. So in Revelation, um, it's kind of like this timeline here. We're going to get into chapter 4 and 5, which... Um, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet. So it might not be a trumpet. Um, it says it's like a trumpet. But frequently we have, with the voice of God, we have trumpets, and sometimes uh, thunder or waterfall, all kinds of things that are loud, loud, booming, commanding voice. So it's associated with God's voice very frequently speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place, metatauta. So, <clears throat> the tribulation will run from chapter 6, and it'll run all the way up, really through chapter 18. Chapter 19, we get into the second coming. And during those chapters, as we mentioned, there are no Verses, no passages that talk about church at all. So now taking a look at some of these, let's take a look at some of these passages that address the end. And like I said, there's four major views and a whole boatload of minor views, lesser views about the end. Matthew 24 and 25, those chapters, uh, Mark 13, those are um, with the four disciples. Does anybody remember who they were that were up on the mountain with Jesus? Mark 13 names them all. Matthew 24 does not. It's Peter, James, John, and Andrew all up on the Mount of Olives. Um, and they're all addressing believers on future events. Now, another thing that people will say is, um, well, that doesn't apply to church because Matthew is written to the Jews. Great. Mark isn't you know, addressing or writing particularly to the Jews. He's writing to the Romans. Um, that's his particular bent. But, you know, you can discount 90% of the Bible or better if you just want to say no because it's written to the Jews. Um, not everything that is written in the Bible is about us, but everything in the Bible is for us. Well, the inverse can be true, too, is that just because... The Bible is not, certain passage is not written about us. doesn't mean that there's nothing in it that applies to us. And um, church was not founded yet, but Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said it was coming. 
right, and uh, described the church, and he says, I will build my church. So, yeah, church isn't in this passage yet because Acts chapter 2 hadn't happened yet, okay, the founding of the church. Now, Luke 21 um, had a fellow try to beat me up online today because he says, you need to read your Bible better, and he quoted a uh, Luke 21 verse and tried to tell me that that shows that the rapture does not happen until after the tribulation. Well, Luke 21, it's not rapture, it's... Uh, He's talking about the second coming and the wording, the phrasing on everything in Luke 21 is a little bit different because this is where the Olivet Discourse really started was in the temple. So the first thing Jesus and his disciples did is they were in the temple. They were talking about things concerning the end times and Jesus wrapped it up and he left with his disciples and they go up on, they're making their way up to the Mount of Olives and that's where these disciples asked kind of a threefold question that we'll get into at some point in Matthew 24. Because we need to step over there. And um, he elaborates on these things that are going to happen immediately, but also the things that happen in the future. After, you know, Metatauta, after uh after the church is gone. Okay, there's things about, and then the end will come. And that's a phrase that he says a lot. And then the end will come. And then the end will come. You'll see that in Matthew 24 quite a lot. So Jesus promised his disciples that he would come again. And before his return, there would be birth pangs or uh, events before the signs of the end. Clear enough? Any questions about that? Birth pains, what Jesus taught about the end. Okay, he said, and again, we will go into these. There will be wars, famines, earthquakes, pestilence. Are we seeing any of these? I think we, we probably are, right? Yeah. So wars, famine, earthquakes, pestilence. I could swap that photo there out now for COVID because that's a crater, right? Pestilence, okay. Wickedness will increase. Yeah. Uh, there will be fearful events and signs from heaven. And um, people will be deceived by many false messiahs. So those are some things that Jesus said concerning the end. Um, birth pains. Believers in Christ will be persecuted and killed. This has always been the case, but really, honestly, are we seeing it? Have we seen it in the past as broad, as wide-ranging, as global as we're seeing it now? And I think there are probably statistics somewhere that would say that nothing is quite like it's been lately. Believers will be witnesses of Jesus to kings, world leaders, in other words. Many will turn away from the faith. Now, Let's be, be clear. People talk about a great falling away. Um, and, and like this says here, many will turn away from the faith. A lot of people offer lip service or, or go to church um, out of tradition. Especially in this area, it's your culture, right? You grow up here. You grow up going to church. You know, whether you're a believer or not, you go to church. And there's these old churches that just will not die no matter what because They've always been there, and they'll always go there. And the family probably owns the building, you know, that kind of a thing. So that, that's just kind of a cultural kind of thing. But does that mean that people really, when they turn away from the faith, they lose their salvation, and they walk away, and now they're not saved anymore? They were saved, and then now they aren't? What does the Scripture say about that? Is that possible? First John says that they left, they were never with us to begin with. First John 2.19, right? They're with us. But then they left that it might be made clear that they never were really, they never were, were really with us in the first place. I think that's a defining, kind of a penultimate verse right there. You can't get around that one. Is that if they left, they never were really with us. They might have gone to church with us and so forth. And I mean, if you're talking about too, that that says that God saved. I mean, we all believe that God's involved in the business of saving. So if He saved us or whatever, and then what? Let them go, changed His mind. I mean, that yeah. goes against Him and His character. 
last, um, your last slide show there, um, the way the birth pangs happen, if you're not saved and you don't have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, it's almost like the frog in the pot where you just get used to it and you don't see it as bad as it is. I mean, things happen and it... It, it starts off with, with six weeks to... Level out, out and then, then uh, always been, you know, and so without the two weeks, two weeks to flatten the curve, and then it grows into two years. Yes. Yeah, but uh, without the Holy Spirit, people are living in fear. They're falling for it. They trust the government. They trust politicians. Mm-hmm. They, plus, they trust so many other things instead of Christ and the church. So the what, go ahead. No, no. Was, I'm sorry. I was, I was, no, no, you're good. I want to hear what you have to say. It was a sense of humor thing. Oh. I, 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 <laughs> That's even better. I was just going to say, if we're talking biblical weeks, that's another. Oh, years. Twelve years. Yeah. <laughs> Don't say that. Yeah. Yeah, sevens a week can mean any grouping of sevens. So. Uh, yeah. uh, a good oxymoron. A few weeks ago, uh, a lady wearing a mask that said, "Faith over fear." Yeah. Like. You, you're wearing a mask. <laughs> Faith over here. Your last one was kind of the, um, I'm not, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I'm having one of those days too. I guess. Contrasting this one where yes. the, the world, it's like the problem, they're just used to it, they're going along with it, they're falling for it, and, and yet the Christians are being persecuted by, you know, the mm-hmm. evil just trying to shut them up and get them away. And There's a lot of pressure to comply and go along with whatever. And, 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 and the other thing I keep hearing is every people, way. people don't consider what we have here in the U.S fact that we have everything means we don't need Christ. Over there in China and whatnot, where they are actually... Laodicea, right? Yeah. Where they are getting persecuted and killed, it's growing by leaps and bounds in the Middle East, you know. But here we have everything. It's not. We have all these Laodicean churches where it's like, meh, I come when it's good for me. I come when it's, you know, I like the music, I don't like the music, whatever. Yeah. And that's not, that's not um, the true Christian. Let's continue. It says in here. Yeah, go ahead. These are things that are going to happen before the second coming. Yes. So. Before the before the, the rapture. rapture. I mean, things that describe the end, but it certainly they'll happen also up to the second coming as well. Yeah, because so. once the rapture happens, then everything will get accelerated It'll, even more. Yes. Okay. Correct. Yeah, it'll escalate even more. You're absolutely right. Okay. So there will be betrayals by parents, brothers, and friends. Now we're seeing that in. It, Boy, that's really startling because our next door neighbor, we're seeing that a lot in Canada right now. You know, it's just kind of weird, you know, with the churches and things and arresting pastors and things like that. Yeah, there's been like two or three now, right? At least. I know they arrested for meeting. Oh, Yeah. Well, here, let me know if this sounds like today. So, Romans 132. And though they know the ordinance of God, those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but, and here's the thing, give hearty approval to those who practice them. So are we seeing that today? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're so brave for coming out and admitting you're gay. You know, or mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what, what is that? It's Romans 132. Yeah, absolutely. But we'll see again, like you, to your point, is... Um, the betrayals and things by by family members and people turning each other in and things, they're they're putting together a some type of a system now where you can rat people out for various things. Now this is something the Biden administration is doing and they're trying to set up now where you can report people. So. Um, what, are, what are they going to report people for? Well, probably. Just about anything that they don't agree with, you know. Hey, look, uh, so I saw him leave the house the other day, and he had a gun on his hip all the way to he wasn't didn't have his mask on. To, you know, okay. uh, it could be all kinds of things. That, whatever they disapprove of at the time, and it can be anything. I see something, say something is exactly right. So it's like the website, and you just click and you click. Something. Yeah, and type in somebody's name and their address or whatever, and yeah. So well, it's. Yeah, it's very blue over there. I think there was something where you could report your neighbors at a certain time. Not now, but like when you weren't supposed to. I guess the governor made a law at one point. You're not allowed to have people come into your house. 
right. live in your house. Remember Thanksgiving last year in a lot of states? Report your neighbors if they had yeah, if the cars were pulling up so people have turkey. Yeah. Absurd. Who would have thought that in this country, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what else Jesus taught about the end, um, signs about the end, is um, Jerusalem will be surrounded by armies. Um, they've always had their enemies. I mean, they, they, um, the ink was not even dry on all the papers they signed in 1948 when Israel was founded um, at the UN when you know, they come under attack. So you've always had some of the Arab nations around them. Now, now it's uh, they are in the crosshairs of China, Iran, Russia. So the abomination that causes des- desolation will stand in the holy place. This is something that we're told we know from Second Thessalonians two, for instance. Um, these things don't happen until in the middle of the tribulation week. So that's not yet. But the staging for all that stuff's going to happen. So in order for you to have an abomination that causes desolation, which is a temple reference that had to do with the Antiochus Epiphanes um, a couple hundred years before Christ, you got to have a temple. Is there a temple in Jerusalem now? There's not. So by definition, you got to have the temple before you can have the abomination of desolation. And Daniel chapter 9, before the Antichrist who comes in, this prince who comes, before he can stop the sacrifices, you got to have a temple where you can have the sacrifices for him to stop it. So everything, so Christians, I don't know why all you Christians are getting excited about a temple because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that temple is not going to be right, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the Jews over there in Israel are believers or not. I mean, we be prefer that they are, and, and someday they will repent. We know that from R- Romans chapter 11, for instance. It doesn't matter if the temple, it doesn't even matter if the temple is consecrated. It doesn't matter if the temple is in the wrong place. If they put it on top of the Temple Mount and the opinions of more and more, including some Jews who are afraid to speak out because they might, you know, lose their credentials or whatever, the temple isn't supposed to be on the Temple Mount. That was a Roman garrison. The, where was the temple built? Where was, you know, David went and bought the city of David, which is a quarter mile to the south. And so Solomon built the temple in the city of David. So a true temple should be built in the city of David. But you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where exactly they build it or what they call it or whatever. There's got to be a temple there. It doesn't matter if it's a consecrated temple or not. What we get excited about as believers or we should be excited about is, oh, that means we're that much closer to the rapture and the second coming of Christ because we can't have these things that Jesus said happen in the end until this happens. So that's what we get excited about. Birth pangs, to me, have always been the same way. Um, I, You know, Okay, I'll speak for myself and for Hillary. When with each of our kids, I was not happy to see the little putsy putsy labor. Okay, um, once in a while, we'll, let's, let's go for a walk and see if we can pick up the pace here on on the labor and get it over with, so we can get that get that baby out of here. So we go for walks or whatever. Because the really intense labor that kind of made her bend over a lot. Like, ooh, I felt that one. That's kind of, you know, okay, well. Yeah, I'm sure you didn't. She but now, four wheeling that would that might break your water. That might break your water. <laughs> she refused. But the good thing is, too, and I don't know if you covered this, but the the temple is ready to be made now. It is. I, I didn't mention that, but they do have uh, they have the plans. All the they have the implements are all yes, all the the cornerstones made. It's all ready to go. They got. I saw a, a quote from a, a Jew who is involved in this whole process and said, oh, they can have the whole thing up, put together, and ready to go within 18 months, no problem. Red heifer? Red heifer, yes. They're being yeah. born? They are. Everything's ready. So the, the, the stage is set, you know. Do they know where they're going to build it? Well, you know, I'm sure they do, but they're not talking about it. 
not publicly. One time, um, the whole question came up because part of the, the whole mercy seat thing and whatever else is supposed to be the Ark of the Covenant. The question came up with Ned and Yahoo one time, and finally, without really going into detail, he finally said, we know exactly where the Ark of the Covenant is, and when the time's right, we'll go get it. So there's rumors that, uh, you know, the, the Ethiopian story, I, I, it's been debunked too many times, supposedly, yeah. But they have found places under the Temple Mount, you know, like rooms where they've done the soundings and things like you do looking for oil and whatever else, and they've, they've found all kinds of things, and they just haven't broken some of these walls yet, and they talk about it, but um, it might be in one of those areas. So <laughs> underneath the, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, so we get excited about that for that reason. These are birth pangs. Um, and I was excited that she was in labor and that the labor got more and more intense. And, you know, the baby's crowning and you can see the head and she's in all kinds of pain, probably white hot pain. And probably I, it was probably wise if I tried to keep a little distance between us by that, at that point. But the excitement was not in seeing her in pain. The excitement is, the baby's coming. This will be over with and we'll have that baby. So that's probably why the, we have the same type of language here. So Jerusalem will be trampled on by Gentiles. Is that the case now? Is it only Jews that are over there in Jerusalem right now? Um, and uh, they can hardly, I don't know, they can hardly even go up on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem right now, the Jews, you know, they're restricted with that. So that's one of the signs. Um, the sun will darken, the moon will not shine, and the stars will fall. Um, that's specifically we have scriptures that point that right into in the middle of the tribulation week. False prophets will perform signs and miracles. Well, now they purport to, and I call these false labor, I guess, because these are they're all false prophets anyway, but these are also false miracles. Now, the question comes up, and I hear people say, well, no, only God can do these things, so these won't be real miracles. They'll be, well, God sometimes grants permission for things that, you know, aren't necessarily savory, uh, like the Antichrist doing miracles and things like that. People say, well, they can't be like, uh, you know, he raises from the dead. He must fake his death and then come up, well, the Lord might just grant it to him. To, to do it for that time. You know, he's, the restrainer is out of the way and the Lord might be just permitting this to happen for this season as part of his judgment on the earth. So I'm not going to say definitely that all those things that happen will all be fake miracles and fake signs. They might be real signs to deceive. Look at Pharaoh's advisors who duplicated Joshua and Moses. Man. Yeah, I would like to see a, a modern magician now turn a stick into a serpent or turn water into blood like Pharaoh's soothsayers did. They obviously had some skills that some of our better magicians have never, not without green screens, right? Um, severe ocean activity will disturb the nations. Um, your guess is as good as mine. Um, Tsunamis and, and, you know, the earthquakes and the volcanic activity and some of those types of things. Earthquakes can certainly affect a lot of things, right? And there's going to be many great earthquakes during that time, not just one. How many volcanoes were going off there for a minute? There were like three or four. I know the Ring of Fire especially is really, but not just there, yeah. We, we still have one going right now, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, people will faint with terror. You know, it takes a lot of it takes a lot to freak people out these days, especially you know in our movie generation where we've seen it all. You know, um, the things that scared me as a kid, watching a scary movie or something. My sister'd say, "Oh, let's watch this movie." You know, we watch it and somebody with a lot of makeup on and pretty scary. You know, or a guy with a hockey mask, whatever. It's scary. And nowadays, that kind of stuff's. You know, we we're not terrorized quite as easily we're kind of desensitized but people will faint with terror i don't know if it's what's going on in the world where it's going to make it like that but um i just don't want to be here for that um jesus will appear in the sky that's the one i'm looking for and of course the church will return with him 
the scriptures say. We get, we get a lot of that in John 14 as well. Uh, trumpet will sound. Angels will gather God's elect. And that's very Matthew 25 type of stuff. Jesus said no one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. This passage, when we get there in Matthew, we're going to spend a little time there because this is kind of like uh, a triple application. One is here, um, but no man knows about the day and the hour, that whole um, no one knows things is has meaning concerning one of the feasts of the Lord. There were seven feast days that the Lord ordained. He established. These aren't Jewish feast days. These aren't just holidays they set up. These were ones the Lord established and said, you're going to do it, and you're going to do it these, this way and on these days, and you will keep these forever, he told Israel. Um, one of them, which is the next feast day that Jesus has not fulfilled in his life yet, is Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. And I'm trying to figure out how far I want to get into this because I'm kind of committing myself here now. Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets, or the secularized version is Rosh Hashanah, but the Feast of Trumpets is known as the Feast that No Man Knows. And the reason why, all the other feast days happen on full moons. And those are really obvious, right? A full moon is pretty obvious unless it's cloudy outside. Feast of Trumpets, or Yom Teruah, happens on a new moon. So what would happen is, is they send a, they send a couple of witnesses up to the highest point, and they're watching for a new moon. Now, it's not a NASA Western culture type new moon where it's all a black disc. You know, let's look, let's look for that round disc where there's no stars. <laughs> it's not, not like that. What it was is um, you, they're looking for that first sliver of the new moon. So we've had the full moon. It went away. Now it's gone. Now they're waiting to, they're looking to sight the new moon. And so when they see that first little sliver of new moon, that's when they're ready to pronounce it. But the problem is, is that since you're, you're at that time of year where um, you've got the, the equinox where the sun and the moon kind of line up, what happens is, is you've got the moon kind of making a, a quick showing, a new moon at that time, and then it drops back down and, and disappears at the same time as sunset in the same direction. So it can be kind of, you know, be glare, and so they might miss it the first day. So they'll have the celebration two days, because if they miss it the first day, which might only be 1% or 2%, they'll see it the second day. So they don't know if they're going to kick it off and they're really going to call the official beginning of the new season. They don't know if it's going to be the first day or the second day. So it's the feast that no man knows. Okay, so that's one. The second application of this where the Lord set this up um, in the Old Testament is it's, uh, it has to do with the wedding tradition. So what did Jesus talk about, for instance, in John 14? He talks about, I'm going to go and leave, and if I go, I'm going to come back for you in my Father's mansion, our many rooms. I'm going to go prepare a place for you, this kind of thing. This is all language terminology that has to do with Hebrew wedding tradition. So what happens is, is... When the bridegroom leaves, he leaves her with a parting gift. Now, in our culture, the closest we have to it is, here's an engagement ring. This shows that you're mine, and I'm coming back. We're committed, that type of thing. For Jesus, it was the Holy Spirit. He says, hey, when I leave, I'm going to leave you with a helper, etc." And he left us with the Holy Spirit for the last 2,000 years, okay? He says, if I leave, I'm going to come back. And the angel said the same thing to the disciples, right? The same way he left, he's coming back. And Jesus said he's coming back repeatedly. So, and we see him coming back in the book of Revelation later on. So what happens is, is that the reason why no man knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father, is that was language that the disciples would have understood. Because they're thinking, they notice here in that passage, they never say, what are you even talking about? That doesn't make any sense at all. Because they knew the language. 
They knew the terminology. And what that meant was, oh, it's like the wedding. Well, the wedding where the bridegroom comes and gets his, uh, he, he um, leaves the gift with his, his bride, and they're married now legally in, in every, every way, but the way that is procreation. They're legally married, okay? Until they have the ceremony that happens roughly about, about a year later. And he goes away to the father's house and he's preparing a room. It's not like today where we go and we rent an apartment or, you know, get a van. <laughs> well, depending on how poor we are or buy a house, buy our own house or rent a house or anything like that at all. They just kept adding on to the family home. So they'd go to the father's house and they would add do this room addition. And the son never knew exactly when it, he was going to get the go-ahead from the father. He would do this room addition and he'd say, Dad, I think I'm done. Come here. Dad would come in and he might make some suggested, suggested changes. For, because he knows what the woman wants, what she's going to need. No, she's going to need more cabinet space than that. Where's the pantry? You know, whatever. And so he, the father's wiser. He's been married longer, and he knows what she needs. And at some point, he says, okay, go take your bride. So that's what the disciples understood. So when you're praying, and you're praying for the rapture, don't just pray, Jesus, come. Say, Father, please send your son. That might be the right way to do it. That's what we're really waiting for. Now, does Jesus now know, I, Jesus now, is, now knows down to the nanosecond when he's going to come. But remember, when Jesus came the first time, um, he shed off many of his attributes. He was not, for instance, omnipresent everywhere at once. Okay, we talked about that in a little bit in um, Bible study this morning before church. Um, many, any wealth that he had, he didn't cling to any of that. Uh, everything that he had, the Father gave him. And he had all things that he needed, the Father gave him. Any knowledge he needed, um, any sermon prep he needed, it all came from the Father. And it, that was the nature of the first time. he Because he, he suffered in all ways and tormented in, in all ways that we are like a, a human being when he came the first time. Once he ascended... He sat on the right hand of the Father, and now the way he was before in eternity past, he is again in, in all of those ways. So now the Son knows. At the time he was on the earth, no, he didn't know unless the Father told him. Okay, so that's, we'll, but we'll get into all those. We'll try to unwrap those a little bit more later on. Any questions about those? That's all a mouthful. But I want to make sure, sometimes we make assumptions and we do Bible studies or pastors will preach or whatever. We make some assumptions about some verses. And I don't want to make any assumptions because some things, you know, are going to be new that you haven't heard before or you've heard and you never really got explained. And so sometimes that question comes up. I've heard that a lot. What does that mean? How does that, that work? And we can put the brakes on at any time and examine some of those. Or at least bookmark it and we'll go and revisit it at greater length later. Well, here's the thing about the second coming is it's argued that we'll know, um, we will know the day, if maybe not the hour, we will know the day of the second coming because we have several markers that we'll get into in the book of, of Revelation here that we can, and, and it tells us, okay, 1260 days later. So for instance, the abomination of desolation, when you got the Antichrist standing up in the temple and he desecrates it or whatever 1260 days later jesus is coming so any christians who are on the earth at that time are going to say praise the lord where's your where's your calendar let's put that down in your get your cell phone you know whatever they'll know right down when jesus is coming so right now we don't know when so what what is that verse talking about then? that that would apply more toward rapture i would argue it's actually oh. kind of both but long term it won't be second coming because at some point we do know when the second coming is. Because when you get into um, Revelation 11, 12, and 13, it gives us in, in terms of years, months, and days how long it's going to be 
you know, certain periods of time. So you know when the second coming is. Yeah. <laughs> or, well, if there's a if there's a delay, we can get into this. This is a feast thing, you know, about what the feasts mean. Well, let's let's stick a pin in that and let's remember to do that. But it could be too that there's a rapture on Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. The Day of Atonement, or like a Day of Reckoning, might happen a few days later and begin one period. So the tribulation might begin on the Day of Atonement, and then you got judgment for seven years. Jesus might come back on um, the the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, where he comes to tabernacle or live with us. So there's a different couple different ways that stretches out that we you know you can look at, it, and it'll vary depending on whether they're Jewish in their Hebrew calendar. They've got leap years. So there's some of that going on. And just the way the, Jew, the Hebrew calendar is lunisolar. In other words, they don't just, we apply just the sun to our calendar. Everything's measured by that. Some cultures will use just the moon, you know, like the Native Americans and things like that. It's moon, many moons ago, you know. Hebrews combine both. But that's another story. But yeah, there's some different ways that that'll apply. It's kind of interesting. So you get people, though, doing all kinds of funny math and trying to, they think they've got it right down. They know when Jesus is coming back. And, they, and there are some people, there are some feuds going on online right now. They insist that um, because a generation is this number of years, that 19, or, uh, 2021, I'm 1921, where am I? 2021 has got to be the year of the rapture. Because he's got to come back by 2028 because of how many years later it is than 1948. It takes seven years off. And they'll fight over that to the death. But they miss the whole thing about Jesus didn't say a certain number of years as a generation. He just said the generation that sees the beginning of these things. The beginning of these things. What things? The things he was just talking about, including uh, the reestablishment of Israel. The generation that sees the beginning of these things will not pass away before we see the coming of the Son of Man, the second coming. And that you can take seven years off that. So, the World War II generation. Not everybody from 1948 who was around then to see Israel become a nation and to see that reestablishment, the fulfilling of that promise and see the beginning of the, that promise which has growing implications future, like during the millennium when the kingdom's established. The generation that sees 1948, May, the beginning of those things, will not pass away before we see the coming of the Son of Man. So how long is that? Well, you know, we just had, I just saw somebody with a birthday like 119 years old online, well, you know. I, so. I always argue that 1948 isn't necessarily the beginning because Israel did not occupy Jerusalem until 1967. There's that argument too. So is it Jerusalem or is it the land? He didn't say my city, he said the land. But there's, I've heard that argument too. Early on, because people wanted the rapture to happen earlier, they said, well, really, you know, you can go back to a little after 1900, you know, when uh, they started working toward, you know, signing an agreement to get into Israel so that the migration can happen in the land before 1948. So really, in the early 1900s, you know, you had, there was another document that was signed. So people will tug on this and pull on this a little bit to try to make it happen and, and it's wish fulfillment and I understand I sympathize but we just simply can't do it we won't know until we get there because we don't know what we don't know you know <laughs> all right so because of the increase of wickedness he says in Matthew 24 12 to 13 the love of most will grow cold are we seeing that I mean, you can walk down the street and homeless people are laying there or whatever, or shove people out of the way, or just meanness to, how about aborting babies, murdering babies, and things like this. We see love cold, cold now, definitely. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth, and that's Revelation 3.10. Um, from last week. So, what we're going to do is um, 
there are four views. We're going to start off with the common terminology for what I was just describing is dispensational premillennialism. It's pre-tribulation. Pre means beforehand, right? Pre-tribulation rapture is a rapture that happens before the tribulation. Um, that's kind of a, that's where some views are. Um, so the 69 you see at the very front there is because it refers back to Daniel chapter 9, the vision and the prophecy that Gabriel gave Daniel. Um, those have been fulfilled. And then we have this weird interval that Paul called a mystery, the church age, or Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Uh, and then after those things, Metatauta, um, the weird little yellow image with the fire on there, that's the temple burning. That would be 70 AD. <laughs> uh, so pre is, we don't know what year, but there's a, a rapture, and it happens slightly before Daniel's 70th week, because there's 70 weeks in Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. That's why you see the 69, and then you see the 70. That's when Gabriel gave Daniel the prophecy, he described something that encompassed a total of 70 weeks of years. And then you see the question mark next to that pre, because we don't know if there's a bit of an interval, you know, uh, 10 days or whatever between the rapture and the start, the commencement of the actual tribulation week. There's some specific events that the Bible describes are probably going to be what show in earnest things kick off, okay? during the, the tribulation week. Okay, looking again across the top, you've got the mid-trib point of view because Jesus spoke about the great tribulation and the great tribulation in the tribulation week starts in the middle because Jesus refers back to Daniel chapter 9 and says in the middle of the week, um, the Antichrist will stop the sacrifices in the temple and then starts the great tribulation. So some people say, okay, well, that's where the rapture happens then, right before the great tribulation. So three and a half years in. So the first three and a half years where billions of people are killed, the church is going to be there according to them. Then you got a pre-wrath position now, and they say, no, 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 because some of that before that might be wrath or afterwards. The arrow, I mean, I can move, the arrow can move depending on your how you want to move it. It's very flexible, like it's rubber. Pre-wrath. Okay, well, no, no, no. The church has got to leave before wrath because they will admit they're kind of swing toward mid-trib, but, you know, they got to admit that, no, the bride of Christ is not going to have Christ raining wrath down on his bride. That just doesn't work. So somewhere in there before that happens, we don't know when, it's going to be the rapture. And then you got post-trib, which is the oddest view of all, they, although they would disagree because um, they think we go through the whole tribulation and we meet the Lord in the air, but then we come back, second coming. So it's like, whoop, whoop. It'd be a great U-turn in the sky, exactly. And, and then after that is the, the Bema Seat judgments, the sheep and goats judgment, and all of this kind of stuff. And then, and then we go into the believers out of that period, go into the millennial period, which um, other groups will deny that that exists as well. So we'll get into some of these, but I just wanted you to see this real quick map of what we're going to get into, and we'll examine some of these and and I, I will, I, I'm going to hammer this home until you guys get sick and say, I know, I know. And you start repeating it um, for me before I finish. But the main difference between all of these views as opposed to pre-tribulation and pre-millennial, which means Jesus, there is a literal millennium and Jesus comes back. There's a rapture and Jesus comes back before the millennium and all this kind of stuff. Pre-trib, pre-mill. The main difference between the pre-tribulational pre-mid or pre-mill view and all these other views is that pre-trib is the only position that takes the literal view of the scriptures concerning the end times. Okay, by literal we mean normal. Take a normal read of it. It says what it means and means what it says. All the other views will take a figurative or symbolic read of all those passages. Got a pastor that uh, you know, between the rapture and, and the second when the second coming when the church returns with Christ, it's the marriage phase, right? The marriage supper of the Lamb. So he said if, if post rapture were the truth, then that would mean we just have time to grab a quick snack. So <laughs> That's right. <laughs> grab some peanuts, right? 
grab some peanuts like it's on you know, an airplane. Um, so we've we've got an hour, and so we'll we'll go to more. But we got time for questions or comments. Any any more comments or jokes? <laughs> So is, is this helping or is, it, or is it confusing? I hope I'm not confounding. I'm trying to be detailed and it's taken a while and it might take longer than what normally if you'd rattle off stuff if you were just giving a lecture or just up at a pulpit doing it. But I want to be thorough and make sure everybody understands before we go forward. So the, and again, to stress, the reason why we're going into this here is a bit because the rest of Revelation is pretty exciting, but a lot of it people will disagree on or be confused on whether or not their position is, is all millennial, uh, which means there's no rapture, there's no millennium, or whether you're post-trib or whatever. So that we want to clear the decks and get all that out of the way first and address that. I will send off to you this week, if you like, a bunch of verses, maybe, a bunch of passages that are pre-trib verses, just so you can have those passages to look at and evaluate yourself. Um, folks online are out of, out of luck. But if anybody messaged me or emailed me or whatever, I'll, I'll send whatever paperwork or whatever that, uh, that you want, um, and I'll, I'll fire them off your way. And at, for the most part, all the major ones, we'll be going through all these major passages and verses. Like I said, uh, during this time here, I, I want to go into the Hebrew wedding traditions because it is... It is um, you know, eye-wetting, crying kind of, it is beautiful what the Lord has set up in previewing and setting up and establishing the wedding tradition to look like his coming at the end. It's just awesome. It's like, Lord, what did you do? This is amazing what he set up over the years. Plus how the feast days inform the whole idea of pre-trib, pre-meal rapture, and how it informs the rest of the, the tribulation. And... Uh, and so we're also going to get into major passages like the Olivet Discourse. We will get into that. We'll, we'll break the whole thing down. How do you understand it? Because much confusion, confusion um, in that passage, even among good friends, there can be, no, it doesn't. It means this. He's not talking. To this. There's no rapture in that passage. Yes, there is. There's a rapture right here. Well, is there or isn't there? You know. So we'll get into all that, and it'll be. Uh, hopefully, it's fun, and we'll get some energetic discussion over it and we'll see what we can figure out so you know what to read about in you know during the week you know is reread matthew 24 25 um you should keep and regularly read the whole book of revelation and and just really stay up on it because really by repetition um some of the mystery drops out of it and you start some things start falling together for you they really do um like a lot of other passages and i know we've all discussed this and we've we've seen this before and we've experienced it personally is that you can read a passage and not see something and then you know you're you're in year 15 in your your salvation and you read a passage that you read you don't know how many times and you something new jumps out at you and you say oh man where did that come from i didn't realize that you got to be kidding me so this happens all the time so keep reading revelation and the lord will bless okay um i guess we could do a, a quick closing prayer and that way we can uh, make it official and all that. And although I normally don't necessarily like to say a closing prayer just to say goodbye and close it, well, uh, after all the jokes, we probably need to anyway, right? <laughs> we need to repent. Uh, Lord, it's, it's a, a joyful occasion to, to look at your word and, and to be jovial and excited and um, examine your word and see what it has for us. And God, we just pray that you would shine light and um, show us some things that maybe we haven't noticed before in your word. We're not looking to crack open something new that nobody's ever seen before, Lord. We're just looking to understand what's already there. And so, Lord, we ask that you would impart that wisdom to us. For it's in Christ's name we pray and give you thanks. Amen.